end of the summer. Only 22 hours left in summer. This would make this the final full day of summertime before the calendar turns to autumn. Just a little time left for summertime activities on the water or at the ballpark. And the fans coming into City Field getting ready to watch the Mets play the Braves. At City Field in New York, the New York Mets play the Atlanta Braves. This Mets game on SNY is presented in HD by IOTV. Get the best in HD free with IOTV. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to City Field. Gary Cohen, Ron Darling, Keith Hernandez with you tonight as the Mets open a three-game series against the Atlanta Braves. Two weeks to go in the regular season. The Mets have a dozen games to play. On the final day of summer, you want to be playing for the autumn while the Mets are playing for 2010. As for the Braves, they still got a slim amount of hope. Well, they're five and a half back in the wild card. Phillies wrapped up the East. The Dodgers are idle tonight. Colorado is idle. They're a half game uh, behind Florida and a game behind um, the Giants. So they got a chance to move up a little bit with a win tonight. And as you said, Gary, uh, the Mets have one thing to play for. And, you know, this is an old Brave team. They're old, they're old uh, adversaries. Uh, you know, give them a nice little L to take home with them tonight. <laughs> and unlike last week in Atlanta, Chipper Jones, the Mets' old adversary, will be back in the lineup for the Braves against Pat Mish, who makes his fifth start for the Mets. He uh, didn't have a very good go of it against the Braves his last time. Well, he didn't. He really struggled against the left-handed hitters, too. They went 5 for 11 against him. Remember, that's the game that Adam LaRoche had two home runs and two doubles. But the key, really, going against Derek Lowe tonight, who has really struggled in his career against the New York Mets. But conversely, think about it this way. The Mets weren't able to, weren't going to give him that extra year. The Braves did. And why did they give him that extra year? Because he's pitched postseason in baseball. He's pitched big time baseball and they expect him to pitch well down the stretch. He has not done that though. He's trying to recover from a blister in his last start against the Mets. Yeah, the Braves will have to keep their eye on that blister tonight and make sure a low is okay against the Mets tonight. Mets and Braves opening a three game series. All the action coming up tonight on SNY.
Tea of choice for New York sports legend Joe Torrey. By Gallagher Steakhouse, home of sports heroes past and present at Broadway's Theater District at West 52nd Street since 1927. By Pella Windows, the Mets' official window and door replacement company called 1-866-64-PELLA for a special savings today. And by Victorinox Swiss Army, makers of the original Swiss Army knife. The City Field Fanwalk Amazing Moments Bricks are on sale now. A new offering of bricks will be installed along the first and third base sides of the Jackie Robinson Rotunda for the 2010 season. Order your Fanwalk Brick today at Mets.com slash Fanwalk. All proceeds benefit charity through the Mets Foundation. Here's your upcoming schedule. Remember, all Mets games on SNY are available in HD, presented by IOTV. And if you're in the car, listen to every Mets game on Sports Radio 66 WFAN. We promise you, if you do, Chris Matchkowski will not sing again. <laughs> Mets and Braves play three night games tomorrow and Wednesday. Then the Mets go to Florida and Washington, come home, finish the series against the Astros, and there are no more weeks after that until April of 2010. Get your cotton candy while well, you can. Liberty beckons in a couple of weeks for the Mets. Mission low, first pitch coming up. Smirnoff, Chipper Jones in the lineup. He was not when the Mets were in Atlanta last week. Chipper suffering from a groin injury, the latest of his many physical woes over the last couple of years, and he's been struggling with the bat. Not so Adam LaRoche, who has the best average in baseball over the last week, and Braves have had a number of hitters who have been hot, trying to keep themselves alive, having won eight of their last ten, and tonight taking on Pat Mish for the second time of the week. And last time in Atlanta, it was uh, partly Adam LaRoche that got the Braves that sweep as Mish to see his numbers on the season walks the strikeouts about the same only 13 of 104 batters he's faced as a starter have failed to put the ball in play against Pat Mish. Well the Lexus Metsy defense and we're going to highlight David Wright as you see there 
That's his pitcher in the lower right. 15 errors this season. Uh, that's a lot for David uh, for, for for a year. And uh, David's had an up and down season. The Pagan back in the lab, and there is the Met killer who has been talking recently about the possibility of retiring mm. if his results do not improve next year. Next year, he'll be in the first year of a three-year contract extension. Well, he would lose an awful lot of loot, wouldn't he? Yes. Around, what, 30 million if you leave it on the table? Not or? very many people do that. Yeah. I guarantee you the dollar's not gonna get any stronger in the near future. <laughs> so I would reconsider. <laughs> well, perhaps he's well invested. Well, thank you, Adam Smith. <laughs> No, Adam Smith was wealth of nations. Right. This is wealth of Keith. Right. <laughs> Nate McLeod hitting at 269. Just about the same with the Braves as he was with the Pirates. First pitch of the night by Mish is inside. McLeod has hit just 226 against left handed pitching this year. A little bit disappointing from that side. Braves realized very early on this year that they were going to have offensive difficulty. Remember they had the rookie Jordan Schaefer yeah. playing center field early in the season and he just did not hit. So they made the deal in June to pick up McLeod. They stuck with Jordan Schaefer a long time and my God we were like late May and he already had like quote 50 60 strikeouts. Well he was stealing some bases when he got on and he was playing a great center field so that's why they stuck with him. Just hoping he'd come around. And they were hoping to get enough offense from other areas, but it just didn't work out that way because Frank Cor River was off right. to a bad start, and um, first base was kind of uh, an iffy proposition. Casey Kochman wasn't hitting early in the season. Kelly Johnson playing second wasn't hitting. McLeod pops one up to shallow center. Late start in for Beltron, and he slides and can't get there. Beltron started back on that ball, and by the time he started in, it was too late. And McLeod's got a leadoff base in. Well, you can't see Mr. Beltron here, but he did break back. See the bag you did, our cameraman. That's camera two. Al, he got it. And Beltron just got a back break first, and that was the difference and couldn't recover. And we always like to show the eyes on the ball. Look at this. He tends to get under the ball a little bit too much, McLeod. Well, it paid off for him there. He winds up aboard with a leadoff single. And now Martin Prado playing second base tonight. And his bat is really perked up. Beginning with the series against the Mets last week, he pushes a bunch foul. I honestly thought that they were going to do that, Gary. Sorry. Um, hit and run, bunting early. I think the Braves are going to try to take it to the Mets early, try to take them out of the game. Jeffrey Jones on deck. Been a real struggle for Chipper over the last couple of months. McLeod can steal a base. He's got 18 this year. There's been only one stolen base against Pat Mish this season. He's done a pretty good job holding runners, and Prado again showing bunt, and it's one and one. Prado, remember, had those exertional headaches that knocked him out of the lineup the last time the Braves were here a month ago and wasn't hitting for the better part of a month since coming back, but just all of a sudden now he's gotten hot. That's kind of got him hot down there in Atlanta. 10 for 20 over his last five games. Been interesting that uh, Pat Mish, when he has been pitching, for the most part, it's been Josh Tolley who's been doing the catching. You know, the right hand Derek Lowe is pitching, but still, they've developed a nice rapport starting off there in Colorado. One to Prado. Hit hard on base hit. Pagan has a long way to go to reach it. McLeod will go to third and be held up there. Prado into second. And the Braves have second and third and nobody out. 31st double of the year for Martin Prado. Well, Prado again just likes Mets pitching. Turns on that, I believe, a fastball. Wasn't in and not right by David. It was playing in a little bit. Well, you know, it's interesting, Keith, as you see the pitch location. Tolley's glove is up in the strike zone. He hit, almost hits the glove, except it drifts back over the, the inside part. And remember, two attempted bunts pulled right in, able to hit the ball by him. So now Chipper Jones with an opportunity to catch a couple of first inning runs. Chipper, since the middle of August, is hitting just 167. His batting average has plummeted. 
after winning the National League batting title last year, hitting just 271. And Mitch throws a cutter for ball one. I was talking to some people down in Atlanta. The, the problem he's having right now with the groin pole is he's having trouble really driving on those legs, generating any power. Well, we saw him take one pinch at, at bat against the Mets in Atlanta, and he just he looked off. Yes, it looked painful. Yeah. It looked like his legs just were not under him at all. Think about Chipper and all RBI guys. You tend to pitch them away. They love to shoot that ball to the right side of these kind of at bats. Now, Mitch, you have a one and two. What is that? That's the scoreboard. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's Tops. Remember when Tops was the only baseball card in the game? That's right. Maybe getting back to that. One, two. Chipper, it's a weak ground ball. Good enough to get a run in. Castillo throws him out for the first out of the game, but a doubly productive out as McLeod comes in to score, and Prado takes third, and the Braves lead 1-0. Well, two for the price of one there. Uh, the only thing bad, you get an, you get a, an at bat, but you see the cutter there, pure, just trying to go the other way. He gets the runner home and also advances the runner at second base. Professional AB there by Chipper. All hitters would prefer to drive both in with a single, but when... Push comes to shove, right? Yep. 65 runs batted in for Chipper Jones, and now a chance for Brian McCann to get a runner in from third. The Mets will bring the infield in. McCann has been red hot with the bat. And he takes a curveball for a strike. McCann, a nine game hitting streak over which he's hitting 5 16. Four of his 20 home runs this year have come against the Mets. Mitch likes to throw inside, and that has to be a part of his repertoire. He's not a, a flamethrower. When he was having those great games, though, Keith, he was throwing it for strikes. Yes. In the last couple of games, he's been throwing in, going back in there, but not for strikes. Well, his first three starts for the Mets, the lefties were just four for 22 against Mitch, but in that last start against the Braves, they were five for yeah. 11. Two and one to McCann. And the curveball away at three and one. And now Escobar waiting on deck. Good time to look for a fastball away. Pitchers are always a little bit reluctant three and one to come inside. Particularly when they're missing with their pitches like Mish is. So try to get a try to sneak a strike on the outside corner. with a walk. So now runners at the corners with one out and Escobar coming up. Well, a very conservative motion here by Pat Mesh. He does not put a lot of leg power into it. Just kind of stands tall, little leg kick, and then just lets go of that ball. It's more of a dart thrower. Tries to spot his fastball and breaking ball. A little awry right now here early in the game. So now Escobar, who has the best batting average in the majors with runners in scoring position, 387 this year. You see what he's done against the Mets, just killed him, 446. And he takes a cutter for a strike. Escobar hitting 303 overall. He's had a nice season. Prado at third, McCann at first, with a run already in for the Braves. I haven't seen many games with Brian Knight behind the plate. I know he's one of the younger umpires, and, and when you're at home and you think that the uh, strike zone's a little tight, the younger the umpire, the tighter the strike zone. They're very cognizant of being judged uh, by their peers and by the umpires. Ooh. And of course, you've got Quest Tech as well. Exactly. It, it, you know, they just, uh, as you see the last pick, pitch, a little cutter in that beat him. But he was looking to go the other way and swung right through it. Mitch would love a double play ball. He said just one double play ball, ground ball double play this season. One two to Escobar. And the curveball low and in. 
Two and two with Garrett Anderson waiting on deck, left hand hitter. Braves swept the Mets three straight last week in Atlanta and then lost two out of three over the weekend to the Phillies. Yesterday, Tommy Hansen started and took the loss. Slow ground ball, tough to turn to. Castillo with the backhand flip ball. There is not in time, and a run comes home. Just not hit hard enough to turn to. And so Prado comes in to score to make it 2 0 Atlanta. Well, Pat comes in with that hard cutter, gets in on the hands. But just beat it down the line, not hit hard. Jammed him too much. I thought the only chance you really had here, if, if Louis could have really charged that and had the tag and the throw, but I don't think he could have closed the gap close enough, quick enough. Well, watching McCann go in straight to the bag here at second base. Brought to mind last night's game between the Cardinals and Cuff as Anderson hits one deep to right headed toward the Pepsi porch and out of here. Garrett Anderson first pitch swinging a two run homer is 13th of the year and the Braves have jumped on Pat Mish for four first inning runs. Four nothing Atlanta. Oh jumping on the first pitch. Did not waste any time. Let's take a peek here. Wants to come in. Oh, right down Broadway. Wow. And up. Good hitting. That's a veteran hitter sitting on the bench, watching the pitches, seeing Miss throw inside to all the lefties and, and anticipating that. He faced him in Atlanta, too, and got his first peak. So you're right, Ronnie. Now Adam Rose, you homered off Mish in Atlanta last week. So Mish has now given up seven home runs this season in 48 innings. Garrett Anderson, not a noted home run hitter, but he jumped him. All speed pitching is one and two. Looking a little beleaguered in the first inning. Talking about that St. Louis Chicago game last night. Bottom of the ninth inning looked like the Cardinals had won it with Matt Holiday breaking up a potential double play. They were celebrating, but Holiday was called out for interference and the game went to extra innings and the Cubs beat the card. And I saw the play. It was a, a great call by the umpire. He got it right. Holiday was probably about 10 feet away from the bag and uh, not even close. And it'll been the third consecutive walk off win for the Cardinals against the Cubs, but not to be. So instead, Chicago won it in the 11th on a Jake Fox two run homer and kept the magic number for the Cardinals for clinching that central division at four. Struck him out. LaRoche down to end the inning, but not before the Braves put up a four spot in the first inning. Two run homer by Anderson to cap it, giving low a 4 0 lead.
lineup brought to you by Geico, Daniel Murphy. 12 extra base hits tied with Albert Pujols for the most in the National League in September. Derek Lowe getting the start for the Atlanta Braves a month ago. Just about a month ago, had his worst start of the season here at City Field. Three innings pitched, nine hits, and eight runs. His last start, last Tuesday against the Mets, lasted just two innings because of a blister. Gave up three runs in those two innings before departing. Just looks like he's lost his bite on his sinker, Ronnie. He's had a lot, a tough two months. He's lost, two months. The, he's lost the tilt, Keith. I, I think what happens for sinker ball pitchers is if you can see the sink, it's not good sink. You, you want it where it's really late, like that pitcher did in his day, Roger McDowell, one of the best sinkers I ever saw. Yes. Angel Pagan hitting a 304 after a three hit day yesterday. Chipper Jones in on the grass to field it, and that's the first out. You, you can call him Larry if you want, Gary. And the Ford Bravo defense. And we're going to highlight another third baseman over there. And there's 21 errors this season. So Chipper, he, he's played some left field in his career, some third base. You've got to think that third base is his best position, don't you think, Gary? Opposed to left field, you remember? You recall? Uh, he was a shortstop when he first yeah, came up. Right. And there's been a lot of talk, very interestingly, about Chipper moving to first base eventually, and he has tried his best to put the kibosh on that. In fact, there's a little conspiracy theory going on uh, in Atlanta right now because Chipper is very good friends with Adam LaRoche and has been very heavily lobbying Braves management for them to re-sign LaRoche for a long term. And there are some who feel that he's doing that to make sure that they can't move to first base. The wheels are turning, Gary. The wheels are turning. <laughs> That's always a problem when you've got a veteran player that wields a little bit too much power. Not saying that Chipper does, but they have an influence. Not to say that Adam LaRoche yourself. Not right. to say that Adam LaRoche wouldn't be a good signing because he's a terrific player and whoever signs him in the offseason yes. is going to get a good bat and a good glove. Castillo lines one to center field and that's in for a base hit. Well, Louis who had two hits yesterday. Continues to bang out the base hits and the Mets have a one out base runner. Well, that's what Keith was talking about. That's the sinker right there to just stay right in the middle of the plate. As a hitter, Ronnie, that kind of sinker, yeah. you can you can anticipate where it's going to move to, you know, and you got plenty of time. It's in slow motion. As a consequence, despite Lowe's 14 wins this year, there are only three pitchers in the league who've given up more hits. Derek Lowe. That's now 212 hits in 179 innings. The league is hitting over 300 against him for the year. Here's David Wright taking the ball. Well, he's gotten the most runs of any of the uh, Braves starters for one. And secondly, he's had a weird year. He's had three good months and now uh, working on three bad months. So that's uh, we'll see how he finishes in September. And the Mets have seen both sides. Yes. Of that. He pitched two very good games against the Mets earlier in the year. And then a dreadful game a month ago and then uh, you know an injury plagued one his last time. You always want to stay away from those dreadful games Gary. They're terrible. They're murder on an athlete. And an ERA. <laughs> Do you ever have a dreadful game? Yes I have. Name me a dreadful game. Well, I had a dreadful, a dreadful career for me. I had an 0 for 4 Shea where I hit in a, I think I hit into two double a double plays in crucial situations and one to end the game. I don't remember who it was against. All I remember there was two Yankee fans down the right field line that when I busted down the line and went into the outfit on my follow through up, I ran by the bag and let me have it. You see Travis teasing the kids there? Yes. <laughs> Travis is very low key, never says anything, but he's he's got a little spark in him there. He's an instigator. <laughs> Right, it's a slow ground ball trickling toward the hole. Prado runs it down and throws him out with a beautiful 360. Nicely done by Martin Prado, who went a mile and a half to get that ball and throw out David Ray. Well, off the end of the bat, and boy, I'll play snow cone it. Very nice. It's all about the throw, in my feeling. He's, he ran a long way to get to the ball, but this is the play right here. I'm throwing off balance with a little mustard on it. You know what I like about great infielders is that it's like a vector. They know where to run to, where they can get to the ball, but at the same time can get the runner. Vector. That's a what? that's a ray yeah. being intercepted by a vector. Jeez, put you in an F-16. <laughs> <laughs> 
Carlos Beltran, six for 12 over the last three games, hitting at 337 for the year. Escobar in front of it. And throws out Beltran. Three ground ball outs for low in the inning. One hit and one left after one 4 0 Braves. Now, as a first baseman here, you want to give a target because now his back's to the play. He comes up. He knows the general area you're at. And his ball, because he's throwing sidearm, is going to start more up the line here and sink back over towards inside the line. So you have to stretch, too, which makes it a tougher play because it's a bang-bang play. Keith, you want to be more on the inside, inside of the bag or it's the outfield side? Out, of the bag. Outfield side, but inside, too. So right in the corner there? Right in the corner, yes. Yeah, so your maximum stretch. It was nicely done by LaRoche. LaRoche uh, uh, knows how to play uh, first base. Another play that's easier for the left-handed first baseman, right? Because you can reach out more as opposed to the backhand yes. for the right hand. Yes, yes. That's a position, you know, made for a left-hand for optimum uh, efficiency. Matt Diaz leading off in the top of the second. Diaz hitting 321, but more importantly, 409 against left-handed pitching. That is his forte. And he's platooning these days with Ryan Church in right field. And he drives one deep to center field. Going back for a look, Beltron, but that's gone. Matt Diaz with his 12th home run of the year. And they are teeing off on Pat Mish. It's 5-0 Atlanta. Well, you do have to say something about this Braves lineup. They might have struggled to score the beginning of the year, but when you have a Diaz hitting eighth, LaRoche hitting seventh, and Anderson hitting sixth, it's well, a pretty potent lineup. A very odd hitter, Diaz. He's a very mechanical, and he can look very, very bad at times, and then he can do that to you. And that was just a high fastball over the plate that he just covered. Well, the Braves have now hit 142 home runs this year. Totally with the low target, the ILTV pitch differential missed by about a foot. Derek Lowe bloops one. Murphy going back has no idea where it is, and it falls for a hit. That's an almost impossible play. You have to just hope that it comes down over your shoulder if you're going out that way. I was looking at my scorecard. Let's take another look. Yeah, that's a tough chance. Yeah, it's right over his head. He tried to run to the spot where he thought he'd be able to pick it up and just it drifted to his left. You don't want to turn your back so, so early on the pop up. You kind of want to run a little bit, maybe not so squared. So you have an idea You're looking over your shoulder. Yeah, you always if you but can, tough, that's a tough play. Yeah, if you can, you want to try to play it off one side or the other, but impossible for Murph there. So Lowe has his 10th hit of the season and now McLeod, who had a fly ball single to lead off the game. Five hits now off Mish, including the home runs by Anderson and Diaz. And the Braves threatening to blow this thing up early. 
Wow. A little surprising there, don't you think? I, yes. I'm telling you, I, I think right now they're just going to try to bury the Mets early and hope that a team that's in the second division with the way they played this year is going to not come back. That's Broadway, first man up in the Mets bullpen. As McLeod takes high one and one. Now, Mitch went five innings against the Braves last Tuesday, gave up four runs and eight hits in that game. Remember, the Mets handed him a 3 0 lead in that yeah. game against Lowe. One and two to McLeod. You know, this Mets team has played better against the Braves the last couple of seasons, but this is a uh, Braves team that has won 10 out of 15 against the Mets this year. Tenth time in the last 12 years that the Braves will win the season series for the Mets. Broken back. Murphy going to second to get the force on low. And that's the first out of the inning. Well, the one thing I like about Murph when he stays controlled is his aggressiveness to get the lead run. And this is a broken bat and a slow roller. You got a pitcher on base. No, your base runner doesn't run well. He's not going to run well. Get the lead runner. Absolutely. Nice play. Meanwhile, the barrel of the bat going into the uh, well next to the dugout. Fortunately, uninhabited. And I do believe Murph's going to go to winter ball this year in Dominican Republic and play, uh, I think, on the ball club that Ken Oberfeld is going to manage. Here's Martin Prado, and he lines one toward left center field. Pagan will have to play it on a hop. McLeod pulls in at second. So the third hit of the inning and the sixth in the first 11 batters against Pat Mish. Well, just not a very good read on the bases by McLeod. This is clear that it's going to be a base hit. And with McLeod's speed, but he wasn't sure whether Pagan was going to catch that ball or not. But... This ball's ripped. You know what part of it might be? You know, the Mets have been playing that left fielder over toward the gap. Perhaps McLeod was anticipating Pagan would be a little closer to the gap. Well, you kind of know where your outfielders are. Yeah. The first thing you do when you get on base, find out where your outfielders are. And now when you're on second base, you want to know where your infielders are, right, Keith? And ball, everybody. Everybody, you're right. So now Chipper Jones who drove it a run with a ground out his first time. Two on and one out. And Mish may not be long for this game. If he can't get through Chipper, who hits one in the air, deep to left, right down the line. Back toward the corner is Pagan near the wall, and it's out of here. A three-run homer for Chipper Jones. The Braves have hit three home runs inside the first 12 batters. Number 17 for Chipper, and it's 8 nothing Atlanta, and that may be that for Pat Mish. Wow. Well, Chipper has not been hitting. He's not been healthy, but against the Mets, that's now 42 career home wow. runs of his 425. Mish is done after an inning and a third, having allowed eight runs. Call to the bullpen, brought to you by Lincoln Mercury. Wow.
short and very bad day at the office for Pat Mitch, gone after an inning and a third. Lance Broadway on in relief to face Brian McCann, who rolls one out to Luis Castillo. And that's the second out of the inning. Well, Broadway did a nice job in his last appearance against the Braves a couple innings. No runs. If you watch him pitch, Keith, he, he's a guy that he doesn't throw too hard, but he keeps everything knees or below, it seems, when he's right. You see, he has trouble against the lefties, hitting over 400 against. I know it's early. He hasn't had a lot of appearances. But he's a sinker ball pitcher, takes, throws that change up. Here's Janelle Escobar taking low and away. He must keep the ball down, Mr. Broadway. A little chat with him in Atlanta. And after that nice performance, the two innings he pitched, he said I was able to really keep the ball down. You never want to throw the ball right down Broadway. Maybe 7th Avenue, but not Broadway. 7th Avenue is on the corner. Another broken bat. Valdez handles it, throws out Escobar. So Broadway comes in to mop up in the second inning. Four run score, homers by Diaz and Jones, eight nothing. Visit the official online shop of the Mets at Mets.com. Browse the largest online selection of authentic team gear, including official caps, T-shirts, jerseys, collectibles, and more. Daniel Murphy pulls one down the line past LaRoche and into the corner. Daniel will pull in at second base with a leadoff double. So with the Braves up 8 to nothing, Murphy sees one pitch and has his 36th double of the year. Well, we've been seeing Murph do this more often, and that's not... Taking a pitch. He likes it. getting up there, looking fastball first pitch and going after it. 13 extra base hits now for Murphy in September. That's now the most in the National League. He had two yesterday. Well, Murph's average is on the rise. Here's Jeff Francoeur playing against his old team. And he hits one to the right side. Prado makes the play. Murphy over to third with one out. Not quite as positive a play at 8-0 as it would be at 1-0. He's trying to get a base hit there, absolutely. Just got jammed by Derek Lowe. I'll tell you one thing. You know, Whitey Herzog came over and managed the, the, in 80 when the Ken Borey was fired in Spire Cardinals. And uh, once he took the helm the next season, he stressed in spring training get over and in, get the runners over, all the fundies that way. But whenever it was a game like this, 8 nothing, he'd, he'd go walk down the bench to the starters and go, don't get them over, just go to Hackham. 
because I need a. I asked him. I need a bomb. I need a bomb. Yeah. That's, I don't want you getting the guy over and say to one. That's nine great, to one. Great managing. Go to swinging. Well, you know, there's situational hitting and there's situational hitting. Eight nothing is a very different situation. Yeah. Exactly. Josh Tolley was one for his last 12 after a terrific start. Infield back, of course, with an eight nothing lead, and that'll get the run in. Chipper Jones will throw to first. So Murphy is in with the Mets first run of the day as Tolley picks up the RBI to make it eight to one Atlanta. Here's Ron's inside pitch on Derek Lowe, part of the business of baseball, brought to you by Xerox, ready for real business. Well, especially in a game like this, you have to slow him down. He loves to pitch on tempo, loves to pitch quick, and quick pitch you. Blister on his finger we talked about in last Wednesday's start. Seems like he's not uh, not affecting him right now. And you have to stay away from pulling Mr. Lowe. If you start to pull, especially left-handed hitters, it's a rollover 4-3 to three all night long. Wilson Valdez hitting a 250 and a two run triple in the game yesterday to help put it away against the Nats. Batting here with two out and nobody on. And takes a strike. Nobody out on deck as of yet. And now Broadway has come out on deck. Somebody set a record. Oh, you know what that is? Yes. That's the guy who is with the guy who is the tallest man in the world. That's his brother. His brother, the eight foot one inch guy's name is Sultan. That's his brother, Hassan. The tallest guy is eight foot one inches tall, Keith. There he is. Yeah. Which, wow. You wouldn't want to be sitting behind him. Looks like he has a bad back. Well, he's eight foot one. Yes, I know. I just, when I see people walk like that, I just like think of my back. I just, I, I know how it hurts. Oh. That is some sight to see, I'll tell you. The first time I ever was in, I walked into a restaurant, Wolf Chamberlain was sitting there, invited me over and sat for him and talked for a while. It's amazing how tall he was yeah. because he always would underestimate his height. People mm -hmm. said he was 7'3", seven, 7'4". Seven, and he always would say 7'1", I think it right. was his yeah, height that he would say. Seven, yeah. one. Well, Sultan Kosin is from Turkey. He's 8'1". He's uh, here in the U.S. for the first time, and the Mets invited him to watch the game today. He was here for batting practice. Wonderful. Wilt, of course. Kansas Jayhawk. Uh, Wilt was an amazing athlete. He was an amazing volleyball player. Track man. Strike three called. Valdez down looking. First strikeout for Lowe ends the inning. And scratch back for one run and trail eight to one after two. Lobster rolls, a catch of the day. They are outstanding. Are they? 
Oh, they use the uh, double-edged uh, double uh, hot dog. It's a New England thing. Yes, yeah. exactly. Weekdays at 5 o'clock, Jonas Schwartz and Joe Beningo get fired up about all the New York sports drama. And now every Monday, get exclusive Jets insider information from the new weekly contributor, Jets offensive tackle Damian Woody, part of the 2-0 gangrene on daily news live presented by city weekdays at five only on sny how about those two and oh jets it's a little green fever around town That's outstanding here's garrett anderson a two-run homer into the pepsi porches first time up his 12th uh, 13th of the year he now has 56 runs back there it's about 10 rolls up wasn't it yeah there's been very little cheap about the three home runs the braves have hit tonight Low grinder right near the bag, but foul. Garrett Anderson now with 2,490 hits. The all time hit leader in Angels history, both California, Anaheim, and Los Angeles. There you go. I got him started. You That's did. right. His first couple of hits are off me. I remember you said that. I said, who's this rookie? Come on. First pitch drive. Right through the box. Charlie Brown shot? Yes, Charlie Brown. That went one way. I went the other. Well, this is the 28th different Major League ballpark now that Garrett Anderson has hit a home run in. And he's not a big home run hitter. Well, Minnesota's got a big game they got to win tonight, Gary. You've been watching that one closely, the AL Central. Twins are in Chicago tonight after losing that game with the Tigers yesterday. Big and come from behind by Detroit, right? Yeah, that was uh, that was a huge win for the Tigers. Instead of one game ahead, they're now three games up. Detroit is off tonight. They're in Cleveland tomorrow. Placido Polanco had a nice game for the Tigers, hitting better in the second half, three RBIs. Castillo shuffles over in front of it. And Anderson retired, one away. So Broadway's faced three batters, gotten them all to ground out. There are your American League Central standings. The Tigers and Twins have four more games with each other next week at Comerica Park in Detroit. Well, they'll be important, that's for sure. I think the Twins will still be hanging around. Real testament to that team, isn't it? Minnesota Twins have been without Morneau now for a week, although now Mauer's hitting about six, six over 600 since Morneau's been gone. Beautiful stop by Castillo, who continues to make eye popping plays. Took a hit away from LaRoche for the second out. Well, nice play by Louis. Louis very sure with the glove going to his left. And he makes a beautiful play there. We've seen him do that all year. Nice stab. All fielders seem to have their stronger side, don't they, Keith? Yes. Nice play by Louis. Luis, excuse me. He doesn't mind Louis. I think Luis is much prettier. It's a pretty name, Luis, not Louis. Sounds like sounds like it's a guy in the shipyard to me. I don't know, it worked for the Kingsmen. That's true. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> Diaz had a long home run to center field his first time up, his 12th of the year. Well, he got a fastball first pitch off of Pat Mesh, not waiting around. And he has an extreme uppercut, doesn't he? For yes, a right handed hitter. He's a very peculiar hitter. But he's got a chance. He rips that bat, and he's a swinger. Never has quite had the same luck against right handers when they've tried to play him every day. He has struggled. Now Broadway behind him three and one. Anderson Hernandez might be called upon to pinch hit with the pitcher spot due up in the third. 
three and two now to Diaz. Lance Broadway, 26 years old, grew up in Texas, went to TCU. Toby Stoner up in the Mets bullpen. 3-2, and Diaz takes ball four. So he's aboard with two out, and that'll get Derek Lowe to the plate. First base runner against Broadway. Second walk issued by Met pitchers. Who no longer lead the National League in walks? Who took over? The Nationals. The Nationals yesterday. Mm -hmm. Head to head. See how much you miss when you're gone? He was here. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they're under my radar screen. <laughs> you were right here. Ooh. Back up the middle and a base hit for low, and so he's two for two. Diaz pulls in at second. Derek Lowe now has 11 hits for the season. Look at his batting average up over 200. Well, as a pitcher, you just throwing that first one down the middle, but Lowe was ready. Well, we talked about Broadway having to get the ball down, get that sinker working. The, uh, Derek Lowe's thrown his hat into the ring. You know, silver bats are given to pitchers also, so. Uh, in this league, that might be tough. You got Carlos Zambrano. That's right. Got Micah Owings. Zambrano's got to get it this year. I think he what, has four home runs. Ed McLeod takes ball one. Is somebody hitting well over 300 pitchers? Yeah. Is it Owings or is it somebody else? I don't think it's Owings. Jason Marquis is a very good hitter, but I don't think he's having a big year with the bat. Dave McLeod takes low and it's 2 0. Oh. By the way, um, I may have spoken too soon. The two walks tonight, Mets and Nats are now even for the season, and the Nats aren't playing tonight. Who's counting? I am. And I bet you Dan Worth is counting too. He doesn't want to be the steward of a pitching staff that leads the league in walks. Absolutely. That'll be something that'll have to be corrected. Well, especially in this ballpark. Yeah. I mean, you should be as aggressive here as anywhere in baseball. That was ripped toward the right field corner by McLeod. That'll bring home Diaz. Low goes to third. And sliding in with a double is McLeod, his second hit of the game. And it's 9-1 to one Atlanta. 66th run batted in for McLeod. Well, the sinker on the wrong side of the plate, down and in instead of down and away, and McLeod rips it. Burn off that S and sponge tap. I think Pat mentioned earlier, just the IOTV pitch differential. Once that ball on the outside corner running away, instead it's cutting back down and into the left-handed hitter. Tough to make any money there. Martin Prado's already two for two, a single and a double, and he scored two runs, and now getting his third turn at bat in the third inning. So the Braves really putting the hammer down on the Mets. Eight runs in an inning and a third against Mish, and now they've scratched against Broadway. And that was drilled deep toward the left field corner, toward the wall, and it's off the fence. That'll bring home two more. Prado goes to second with a two-run double. It's 11 to 1 Atlanta. And they just keep on pouring it on. Prado three for three in the first three innings. And he barely missed a three-run home. Throwing another ball is down, but over the middle. And Lance tonight is not hitting the corners. And that ball almost got out. And you can see right down Broadway. Well, the Braves have come to hit. 11 runs and 10 hits. Four in the first, four in the second, and three home here in the third. I'm going to make your hitting coach happy, Terry Pendleton. Now Chipper Jones has already driven in four runs tonight with a ground out and a three-run homer. He hit one right-handed. Now he comes up left-handed. Well, to tell you the truth, before he uh, suffered those headaches and that setback, Martin Prado at second base taking over Kelly Johnson, who could not do it, was their MVP in the first part of the season. Well, he's certainly swinging like it now. He's 13 for his last 23. So obviously uh, the after effects of the headaches seem to have cleared. 
He's seeing clearly now. There. Oh, Johnny Nash. Yes. 1972. You can see all obstacles in your way. <laughs> 1972. I remember that year because that was my first year in uh, professional baseball, and I'm at the hit of the summer, one of the hits. It's funny how that you have, that's how you remember hits. So it was in uh, St. Pete, Florida State League, A ball. It must have been hot. It was a hurricane went through, too. We got rained out four days in a row in the hurricane. I stayed at the Edgewater Beach Motel. Oh, I know that Fish hotel. Beach Hotel off Tampa Bay. We were swimming when the storm passed in the parking lot. And the next day came, and we said, we're not going to play. No way. Sun came out all day. Field just dried right up. We played. I bore you? I'm sorry. If you can survive a summer playing in the Florida State League, you can play just about anywhere. Yep. So how about St. Louis? On turf. Broadway handles the comebacker, and the inning finally comes to a close, but the Braves score three runs all after two out and nobody on. It's now 11-1. to one. Starting pitcher, you must feel like you've died and gone to heaven. Oh, yep. 11 to 1 in the third. Let me get my five and fly. <laughs> well, Bo has a hand in it. He's got a couple of hits already. Anderson Hernandez will back for Lance Broadway, leading off in the bottom of the third. So, Ronnie, when you look at Toby Stoner, when you have a big lead like this, Ronnie, yeah. does it ever get in your mind? I got to get five in to be the pitcher of record. Do you ever think that in the back of your head? Just you, 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 cross your mind. Should I be honest? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's like absolutely. they've given me a gift, a birthday gift. Well, you know, you know what you're, you're thinking. If it's the course of the regular season, Keith, but it's a May or June game. Really, your thought is, okay, I got to get through five. But also, your thought is, you know, I have this big lead. I have big responsibility to pitch into the eighth or ninth inning. Really give the bullpen a rest. Now, this part of the year, with a 37-year-old pitcher, you might want to try to save some pellets for him for later. So it might be a five-and-fly kind of deal. Let your bullpen save it the rest of the way. Do you remember the game in Los Angeles a few years ago as uh, Anderson Hernandez goes down looking? Tom Glavin was pitching for the Mets, and the Mets got a bunch of runs early, and he was unable to get out of the third yes. inning. I think it was low, actually, who started against him in that in game. In Los Angeles, yeah. And it was like 9-6 to six after two innings, and Glavin had a huge lead and winds up you know, leaving in the third. Yeah. It's, it's got to be as bad a feeling as there is for a pitch. Well, there is, because, you know, it's an automatic uh, willy, as we call it, right, Keith? Uh, a win in the books. Yep. Howie Rose, a put it in the books, and you, and you take it back. Angel Pagan takes a strike. Angel bounced out to third base his first time up. 
Well, news from Houston that the Astros have fired manager Cecil Cooper. Been a bad week for Cecil. During the weekend, Prince Fielder, with the Astros in town, broke Cooper's Milwaukee record for RBIs, RBIs. in a season. Yeah. What's Prince got now? Buck 28. And uh, yeah, and now uh, now Cooper loses his job. Much much worse. Well, Dave Clark named the interim manager. Cecil Cooper was a one, some kind of hitter, a force in that American League, and he had those years up in Milwaukee. And he kind of did it under the radar screen, you in, know? In a weird way, he was overshadowed by the Younts and the Molitors. Right. And Gorman Thomas really overshadowed him with he the, the better player. He was a better player than Gorman Oh, Thomas. absolutely. Oh. Ben Ogilvy, you know, those players. Cooper had a year at 351. And he was a pretty good fielder, too, at first base. He was no slouch at first. Well, I always hated that because he was traded from the Red Sox, which killed me because they decided to keep Boomer George Scott and let Cooper go. What was the trade? What did they get for a uh, first season I, with the Red Sox? Boy, trade? I forget. Oh, um, I want to say Reggie Cleveland, maybe. Reggie Cleveland, probably not a good trade. Backhand flip by LaRoche in time to get Pagan for the second out. So two out at nobody else. Let's check in with Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin? Guys, Luis Castillo comes to the plate. Guys, remember last year when Castillo, before, after, maybe during game four, I know, would walk around with the humongous ice bags on his knees every time. This year, a lot different. He has barely iced his knees for the most part. And, you know, I was talking to him today about his season, and he said, you know, the most rewarding thing is all that work and effort I put in in the offseason, making people realize that last year was was not me, that this is the type of player I want to be. And you could tell what he's really the, uh, the most proud about is the fact that he's been able to play all these games and stay healthy doing it and not go on the DL. That was really important to him, save for the fact that his numbers are better. And, in fact, there, there's another thing that could help, too. He told me in the offseason, now, he worked so hard last year. He was doing five hours a day working out with Rafael Landestoy, who's the Mets coordinator down in the Dominican Republic. But a lot of that work was on the knees and on weight training and getting fit and making sure you're in, in better shape. This year, he said, because my knees are fine, what Castillo wants to do is work on his lateral movement. He says, I feel like I could be better defensively at second base. I feel like I could regain some of the movement that I had earlier in my career. So my workouts will be a little bit different, working on some stretching and some different things. So we'll look for that. Guys, back to you. Well, it has been so encouraging watching Louie this year and uh, having him, you know, like take the hit that he did in his collarbone the other day and stay in the game or, you know, be able to take a hit and stay in there as he pokes another base into center. So Castillo's got another two hit game. You know, there were there were times over the last couple of years where things would happen to Louie on the field and you'd immediately think, well, he's coming out. Yeah. That, that his body was just breaking down and that's just not the case anymore. You mean like when he fell down the dugout stairs, Gary? Is that, exactly. is that an example? Well, I mean, he missed, what, a day or two? Yeah. And then he was back? I mean, you know, last year, or he might have been out for the season, the way things were going for him. Baseball is a strange game. If you had told any one of us that at the mid-March, September 21st, last day of summer, Castillo would be hitting 306, you'd be counting your playoff money, wouldn't you? I think the Mets are going to be in it. David Wright lines one into center for a base hit. So back to back two out hits for New York. Down the middle. David goes right up the middle. It's a good swing there, Chief. So now Carlos Beltran, who bounced out to short his first time, bats with two out and two on. First pitch swinging, grounds one down to LaRoche, who puts it in his hip pocket, side retired. Two hits and two left. Three in the books. Atlanta up 11-1.
Weeknights at 6, Chris Carlin and Adam Shine take on the latest in New York sports, your calls, and each other. And now every Thursday, Jets defensive tackle Chris Jenkins joins the debate and discusses all things gangrene on Loudmouth's Weeknights at 6, only on SNY. Oh, they'll be riding that bandwagon. And why not? Yeah, absolutely. Anderson Hernandez stays in the game at second base. Toby Stoner on to pitch. He'll bat in the number two hole with Castillo coming out. And Brian McCann takes ball one. Stoner's had a couple appearances of three innings each, one against Philadelphia and his last one on September 17th against the Braves when he gave up a run. McCann has walked and grounded out 0 for 1. It'll be McCann, then Yunel Escobar, and Garrett Anderson for the Braves in the fourth. Pat Mish went an inning in the third, allowed eight runs and seven hits. Lance Broadway, an inning in two thirds, three runs, three hits. Boy, there's some hellacious <laughs> swings by these Atlanta Braves. Now, visiting teams continue to come into City Field and hit with power. Wilson Valdez and McCann retired one away. Well, the Mets have hit just 46 home runs at City Field. They've actually hit more here than they have on the road, but opponents have hit 81, which is a pretty fair number, which tells you that. You know, the dimensions may be large, but they're certainly not untenable. And it's one of the reasons why apparently the dimensions will not be changed here, at least not next year. We've got to give it at least a couple of years, don't you? Well, particularly in view of the fact that it never really got hot here yeah, this summer. That's right. It's an unusual summer. I think June and July was the first time in many, many years that the temperature did not go over 90 degrees or it had maybe one or two days over 90 degrees, which is very unusual. I mean, you normally associate hot weather in New York with home run. Yeah. Must have been a lot hotter in the Bronx. Yeah, they didn't have a problem in that <laughs> other borough. I'll tell you that. They're closer to the Hudson than that wind coming off that Hudson blowing out to the right. Well, that must be it. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what happens, though, when they rip down the old Yankee Stadium to see whether it affects the number of home runs they get. Yeah, yeah you're run. right. Well, let's not forget. I mean, they've got uh, big muscle players over there. You know what I mean? They've a guy that someday might have the most home runs of all time. Uh, to share is having an MVP type season. That, that ballpark when he's hitting left-handed is built for him. No question. Johnny Damon has 24 of his 30-something home runs to right field in that ballpark. Escobar down swinging, so Stoner's retired the first two to face him. Two out and nobody on. Matsui's having a great comeback year. Good slider there by Stoner. Jeter. MVP type year. That ballpark is made for his home That's run right. swings. 24 year old Toby Stoner getting a chance here late in the season. It's a tale of two cities. Garrett Anderson takes a strike. Burrows anyway. Anderson hit a home run into the Pepsi porch his first time up. He's also grounded out one for two. Anderson's old club in Anaheim poised to head for the postseason. Their magic number is seven for clinching the American League West. Angels are hosting the Yankees tonight. The Yankees need just a win to clinch a postseason berth. Although the Red Sox keep getting a little closer in that division, just five games back now. But clearly both teams will be in the postseason. The Red Sox recovered nicely from that uh, demolition derby the Yankees put on. 
Everything close is a strike for Brian Knight now. Anderson down looking back to back strikeouts for Starner who gets a 1 2 3. 11 to 1 Atlanta. Game series with the Braves continues tomorrow night at 7:10. Mass Transit is the faster, easier, and greener way to City Field. Visit Mets.com or call 718-507-TIXX for your tickets. And Daniel Murphy with a ticket deep to right field, back toward the wall, Diaz, and it's out of here. Daniel Murphy with a long home run, his 11th of the year, and now it's 11 to two. Murphy, who had a double and a triple last night, a double and a home run tonight. You go, Daniel. You know what? September time to make a statement. You have to say that Murphy's making one. Yep. He now has 51 extra base hits on the season, four in the last two days. And that was a tape measure shot. Well, let's take a peek. Hanging slider, Keith. Oh, and he got it. And as you said, Ronnie, I want to be your first baseman next year, yeah. Mr. Manaya. Well, the question keeps being asked. Can you afford to have Murphy at first base? Do you need more power? And he's trying to show that he's got power. He's got more power than anyone else on this team. Well, right? He's got 11 bombs. That makes him the club leader. One more than right, one more than Sheffield. Tell you what, he set records running around the bases in that home run. And there you go. How about Most that? Most in the National League in September. Excellent. Three and one to Frank Cor. There's always a place in the world where the sun's shining. Outstanding. Three and two to Frank Gore is not usually up there looking for walks. Well, like you said, Gary, the home plate up by Brian Knight, the, the strike zone has just gotten a little bigger here. But it's 11 to 1, 11 to 2 score. And Frank Gore strikes out for the first down of the inning, second of the night for low. Okay, Keith, I have an interesting question for you. Okay, you're involved in a game like this, you're down 11 to 2. Umpire starts to open up that zone. Does that make you angry? Um, or, or do you just expect it that it's going to happen and you want to put the ball in play earlier? A game like this, you can almost expect maybe to get some better pitches to hit. You okay. got a pitcher with a big lead. If he falls, he's not going to walk you. He might be more inclined 2 0 to give you a pitch to hit or try to get ahead. So I never minded uh, blowouts whether we were ahead. Uh, yeah. Either way, what side of the. 
of the score you were on. Brian Knight, the young home plate umpire, calls a strike on Tolley, and it's one and one. Nice adult beverage there on a Monday night in New York. That's that Brooklyn lager. That's a decent beer. And that, you know, in Brooklyn, as it's hit back to low, you, you can have that beer and you can have a pretzel with it. One of my favorite combos. Do you know that it is illegal if you go into a bar or a restaurant in the state of North Dakota, it is illegal for that bar or restaurant to serve beer with pretzels? Why is that? Don't know. It's on the books in North Dakota. Look it up. The dryness of the pretzel oh. entices you to have more beers and there's a problem. Are you guessing or do you know that for a fact? Total guess. That's an invasive government. Jeez. Hey, that's North Dakota. They're pretty, you know, pretty laid back out there. It's like Canada, North Dakota. <laughs> it's not really. <laughs> now, wait a second. Roger Maris grew up in that's North right. Dakota. There's a few other ball players, that's right? That's right. Dakota. Chris Coast. Travis Hafner. Oh, okay. Darren Erstad. Darren Erstad, is he still the only leadoff hitter to have 100 RBIs? Yes. It's a great stat, by the way. He's also the only punter ever to have 100 That's RBIs. That's right. Yeah. Nebraska? Nebraska, yeah. What uh, number was North Dakota when, as far as being admitted to the Union? I believe they were the 30... ninth state. 39th? Yeah. So there were only 11 after that. What's the last? Well, huh? Ronnie knows that. Don't tell me there's 52 states, neither. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Strike call. Things could change, change, though. <laughs> two and two to Valdez. And he strikes out to end the inning. Third strikeout for Lowe. Mets get one run. First pitch in the inning. Daniel Murphy hits it well over 400 feet out onto the tarp above the bullpen. 11th home run for Murphy. That gives him the club lead. 11 to 2 Atlanta. Runs by Chipper Jones, Garrett Anderson, and Matt Diaz. Adam LaRoche leads off in the top of the fifth against Toby Stoner, who worked a 1 2 3 4. LaRoche admits all this offense is 0 for 2. Matt Diaz and Derek Lowe to follow for the Braves in the fifth. Storner missing badly with that change up 3 0. Toby Stoner, who grew up 
in Maryland. He was born in Germany. Dad was in the service. Yep. Roche draws a leadoff walk. So he uh, was well traveled as a youngster. Went to high school in Maryland, to college in West Virginia. All those, um, I have a lot of friends that were Army brats or Air Force brats that grew up all over the world. They're the most gregarious people because they've had to make friends yeah, all their life know. in new places. You know, it really helps being able to throw a good fastball and hook too <laughs> as you move on to Little League and Little League. Make friends in a hurry, though. <laughs> That's right. Die has had a long home run to center field in the second and walk and scored in the third. Murphy playing behind LaRoche. Yeah, I guess if you're the new kid in school, you always are interesting because you're new. That's right. But if you're the new kid in school who's a great athlete, you're probably even more popular. You're going, to, you're going to be part of a group already. Well, I moved, uh, our family moved when I, after my freshman year. And I, I remember I moved over to Millbrae and they had summer football practice. And I didn't know anybody. And I had to go to that school, yeah. get fitted for my uniform, and go out there and not know soul. It was a tough day for me. Did they beat up on you? No. Um, I was supposed, I came over as the quarterback and Frank Corey retreating for the first down. The, uh, the starting quarterback was Dennis Haig. He was also the point guard. He was also a star baseball player. And I came, I became the point guard, the quarterback. Ooh. And he was you the big man on campus, the most popular. And uh, he never a, quite really fit in in that. It was always tough. With him or with the No, he group? was great. We we're great friends. Oh, it's good. Great friends. But it just never really fit in a cappuccino. What's Dennis doing these days? I, was, I don't know what he was doing. He was a fireman in Millbrook. He became a fireman, I believe, a chief. He's a chief. Big red hat and everything? Uh, I don't know. Low is two for two. He scored a run. That could have been an awkward situation. Yes. AT&T high-speed pitch, low at 91. Stoner is topped out at 92. And Toby throws a fastball for a strike, two and one. I found that the uh, the girls in high school were more interested in me being the new kid in the block. They were very friendly. Well, that, that hasn't changed. <laughs> two and two to low. Gift slash curse. Nate McLeod on deck. And now it's three and two on low. In the air to right center and Beltron right there. Finally got him out. Alone needs a rest. He's got another half inning to pitch before he can qualify for a win. I guess his blister's feeling okay. I don't, care, I don't care how that blister feels right now. It feels six, good enough to go out there for three more outs. Six more. Oh, that's right. That's right. Three more outs. Let it explode if it needs to. <laughs> I remember he spent the entire two plus innings that he worked against the Mets last week staring at his right hand. Not been doing that quite as much tonight. Nate McClough up for his fourth time here in the fifth inning. Already two for three, a single, a double. He scored three and driven in one. Time about pitchers dealing with blisters. You ever have to deal with blisters as a hitter? Always spring training. Um, you know, I didn't use gloves. And, you know, even if you wore gloves, I think those guys maybe got blisters too. I wouldn't know, but there was the only time I used gloves in spring training is when I had a blister. And you know, you always have to break in. You'd always get the blisters in the. Uh, uh, Ron explained. But the inside part of your fingers. The inside part of your fingers, because that's where the bat would, 
You never hold a you never hold the bat in your palm. It's always on your fingers. And that's where you get your blisters in the, right in those folds of your fingers. Yep. Castillo or Hernandez settling onto the pop up and the clock retired to end the inning. So Stoner with two hitless innings of relief halfway through 11 to 2 Atlanta. for a win working with a nine run lead. Anderson Hernandez up for the second time. Pinch hit in the third. Stay in the game at second base. It'll be Hernandez, then Angel Pagan, then the pitcher's spot for the Mets. And so the Mets have the bullpen working. And for the first time since being moved out of the rotation, Bobby Parnell up in the bullpen. Good game for him to pitch. All right, agreed. Now, making the transition from being a reliever to a starter obviously takes a while in terms of getting stretched out. What about going back the other way? Uh, very easy. No problems. Uh, he will just uh, come in. There'll, there'll be, you know, not a lot of pressure other than the pressure he puts on himself, of course, but it's a chance for him to come in and, and uh, you know, try to employ all his pitches. Spot his fastball, all the little things that he's tried to do, but it's more difficult, of course, when you're starting a ball game and you feel that pressure of uh, or onus of having to pitch well to get your team a win. Now, when he was working out of the bullpen before, there wasn't as much of a need for him to throw all of his pitches, particularly his changeup. Is that going to be something that they're going to make sure that he does now? I would have a discussion with Mr. Tolley and say, listen, mix it up for this young man. When he gets ahead, I want to see him use that change. Well, this is going to be more of a long relief appearance for him, too, yeah. Gary, not just coming in. You know, get maybe get two outs or just come in for an inning. I think if they, if they can get two or three innings out of them, they'll, they'll, they'll go with them. But you're not likely to go more than once through the batting order. Right, exactly. Yeah, pinch no. it. yeah. And, and two solid innings I'd like to see from Mr. Parnell. But I guess it's catch 22, isn't yeah. it? Because normally, if you're only facing hitters once in an appearance, yeah. there's less need to go to that third pitch. Although I will say that he did face his team on the last start so they know him so it's not like he's going you know with a new team first time through the lineup they have seen him so that'll be a difficult thing for Bobby but listen he's got the stuff just uh, believing in yourself and believing in your stuff and believing that you are better than the hitter that's the great transition for any young pitcher well then the toughest other, the other question is going to be with Parnell coming out of the bullpen 
As Anderson Hernandez drives one of the gap in right center. He's got a chance for three bases here. And Hernandez easily to third with a triple. Missed on the other side of the play. Got a little sink, a little late sink, but it's down and in. Nicely done by Anderson. You know, it's interesting with the Mets, the way they employ their outfielders, that would have been an easy out right at Beltron, but more traditional outfield play by the Braves. So, you know, you can take advantage of this stadium, though, if you have line drive gap hitters. You need to run around the bases forever. Yep. Fourth triple of the year for Hernandez and the Mets 46 the most in the league Pagan will get the run in as Prado throws him out Hernandez comes in to score to make it 11 to 3 Atlanta. So Pagan picks up his 30th run batted in. I was going to ask you about Parnell Ronnie. Yeah. You know, early in the season, we saw Bobby throwing 97 to 99 and the occasional triple digits we saw in Boston. But then the velocity began to come down, and as a starter, he was throwing basically 92 to 94. Is it likely that we'll see him throwing harder tonight? I think we'll see him throwing harder tonight, absolutely. There's an adrenaline that you have coming out of the bullpen as a reliever that's a little different than as a starter because you know you can go as hard as you can for a short period of time. You know, playing when you are pitching as a starter, Fernando Tatis pitch hitting. When you're pitching as a starter, it's more like you're going out there in a chess match. You know, when you're a reliever, it's like you're going out to play uh, checkers, real quick triple jumps, and really quick as far as on the mound. But you really have to do a lot more thinking, set up the hitters, think about what you're going to do the next time they're up people on base there's, there's a lot more involved than just coming out on the mound pure stuff 95 razor blade slider go sit down well, Derek Lowe's been on both sides of that equation yes he has 85 saves in his brilliant career became a full-time starter in 2002 Tatis takes a strike since Lowe became a full-time starter. It's only one pitcher in the majors who's made more starts than he has. Okay. And that's Barry Zito. Low pitch count in the fifth inning. He just went ahead of uh, Burley, didn't he? Yep. Even Burley were tied. Tatis down swinging. Five strikeouts now for Lowe, and that's the second out of the inning. Interesting in this game. The Mets have had a leadoff extra base hit in three different innings. Those have led to their only three runs, but Lowe's been able to settle in each time. Yeah, if he wins tonight, Lowe will have 141 wins, 107 losses. That's a you know, 34 games over 500. Sorry, 116 losses. I didn't add them from this year. Sorry about that. And those 85 saves, three shutouts, nine complete games. And he has a pretty nice postseason record, three and two division series, and has a World Series win. Of course, when he clinched it in 2004 in St. Louis, he started that fourth and final game for the Red Sox that got off the Schneid. You know, we've talked a couple of times about the Braves this last week and about their wealth of starting pitching, and they pitched so well this year. You know, with young pitchers like Tommy Hansen and Jair Jurgens and. Um, the reemergence of Tim Hudson and and Javi Vasquez having an incredible year. I wonder, and I know it's been only discussed briefly. I wonder whether the Braves would ever consider moving Derek Lowe to the bullpen, maybe preserving his arm a little better for the last few years of his contract and getting more out of him that way. Well, they've done it before with John Schmoltz, of course. Well, that was the one thing in before. Right, it's a smash, and Chipper Jones stays with it. Before the Mets got Frankie Rodriguez, if they got low, he could be a starter and a relief. Mets get a run. Trail 11 3 after 5.
Park Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Xerox, document services provider to the Mets. Xerox, ready for real business. Let's check in with Kevin Burkhart. Kevin? Guys, the beauty of having a guy like Sandy Alomar Sr. on the coaching staff, at least for, for me, is you get great stories when you just sit down and talk with a guy like that. And, and talking with Sandy, we were just talking about baseball and when he played. And he was the double play combination with Jim Fergosi for the Angels. And, of course, like we talk, how many times we talk about the Fergosi for Nolan Ryan trade. I asked him what it was like being on the team when that was going down. He said, well, I can remember, obviously, Fergosi was the core of our team. And, I, you know, I've worked well with him. But we were desperate for pitching. We were looking for pitching for a while, and when the trade for Ryan was made, um, you know, the guys on the team weren't really sure what to think. And most of them were, were kind of upset. He said, but for me, I was with the Mets in 67, so I actually played with Ryan in AAA Jacksonville, so I, I knew how impressive he was, so I kind of told them what to expect, and as it turns out, Sandy played behind two of Nolan's no-hit games, so I guess there's a little symmetry there, guys. Martin Prado hits one out to right field. Frank Coors got it. Prado's retired for the first time tonight. You saw Tatis has stayed in the third. Bobby Parnell to pitch. People forget just how good a player Jim Fergosi was. Exactly. I mean, if you're a Met fan, you only think of him as a guy who was a bust who the Mets got for Nolan Ryan. But he was a great all-star player with the Angels. All-star player, gamer. Sarah, high school graduate. Oh, that's Northern Cal, right? Northern Cal, the Catholic school. Uh, Barry Greg, Bonds. Greg Jeffries. Genshin Kawakami up in the bullpen for the Braves. Lynn Swan. Went to Sarah. Here's Chipper Jones who's driven in four runs tonight. Chipper with a ground out and a three-run homer producing four runs. First outing for Bobby Parnell since last Wednesday when he started against the Braves in Atlanta and got knocked out in the fourth inning. Well, got a high one there. And he knew it. Last pitch that Pat Mish threw tonight. This lasted just an inning and a third and giving up eight runs and seven hits, including three home runs. Nice job in relief by Toby Stoner, two hitless innings. Now Parnell behind on Chipper 3-0, throwing 95. Where is Bobby Parnell's future? Is he a reliever? Will he get another chance to start? I find it very interesting that he came in, and here's a guy that's going to go to winter ball and work on being a starter. And immediately came in and pitched from the stretch, which uh, I find that's interesting to me. Well, the book's not out on him here. And, you know, he's got great stuff. It just, you know, he's, you know, he could, you just don't know what he's going to wind up being. He's going to go to winter ball and be a starter there. But that doesn't mean he'll be a starter next spring. He walks Chipper Jones with one out. Let's check in with the studio. Jonas Schwartz is there with the New York State Smokers quit line game break. All right, Jonas, Nick Blackburn pitching that game for the Twins tonight. The Tigers are off, so the Twins with a win could move two and a half back. Brian McCann swings and misses at a breaking ball. He'd like Blackburn. He's got some good stuff. This later in this year, he's kind of lost a little on his fastball, but he throws strikes. He goes after hitters. Really uh, fun to watch. If the Twins were to get into the postseason, who would be their starting pitcher? Who would be their top three? Would Liriano be in that group? No, because they have not pitched him at all. He's in the bullpen. Berry. Uh, Blackburn would be in there. Baker would be one of those Baker's guys. Scott Baker. 114 games this year. Dunsing, the left-hander, would be Made one of the what, guys. Seven big league starts. I know, but he just won one uh, two days yeah. ago. So their best pitcher this year was uh, Kevin Slowey, right. and uh, he had a wrist problem, had to go undergo surgery. But uh, I mean, he had all sorts of injuries. Yeah. Pitcher uh, Perkins. Right. Perkins, that's right. The another left-hander. Uh, one thing they do have, they can get ahead after eight. They got a pretty darn good closer, Joe Nathan. Out of SUNY Stony Brook. There you go. Where he was an infielder. 
one of the great success stories. He started with the Giants, didn't yeah. he, in San Francisco? Yeah. And they, the Giants didn't know what to do yeah. with him, whether he should be a starter or a reliever or what. Minnesota figured it out, didn't they? As they did with Rick Aguilera, That's if you right. recall. Yes, we're not sure what to do with him either. <laughs> <laughs> One two to McCann fouled away. Well, Aggie suffered from you know yes. just being uh, the, you know the, the pecking order. You know he, he was just he had, down the list. He had the so. bad elbow too, and never took care of it. Think about it. The, the Twins have gotten two great closers from the Mets over the years. They got Aguilar. They also got Jeff Reard. That's right. Jeff Reard. But they've had wonderful success. You know, we talk about the Twins and their long-term success with managers and GMs. How about closers? Yeah, that's incredible. Those guys don't uh, don't last that long or fare that well with one team. Swing and a miss, and McCann is down. Good job by Parnell to get the left-hand batter for the second out. Well, Gary, in answer to your question about Parnell, where he's going to come in and throw just his fastball or his changeup, he's working his changeup in here nicely this inning. And that was a good breaking ball there, Keith. Change-ups and breaking balls against McCann. Didn't center it against Jones with the walk, but came back. It's a good game for him to pitch. No pressure. Blow out. Let him go work on things. So now Escobar is 0 for 3. Drove in a run with the first inning ground ball. see the Mets address in the offseason that uh, takes in a whole lot of real estate guys it, it really does Keith go ahead oh uh, what we want to do in the offseason yeah what is team I would like to see um, I'm always a believer in pitching so that's where I'll go I'd like to see them strengthen their, their pitching Start, starting pitching you're talking about uh, the whole gamut I can't get enough pitch. never get enough pitching and everything everything else on a team when you have good pitching Everything else will flow. When your pitching keeps you in a ball game, 
you are going to have a good year. I don't care what, what, what team you are. Well, I, I think uh, I agree with Keith in that sense. Starting pitching, I'll talk about. Um, it seems to be the norm now, if you're a championship club, that you have two complementary one and two starters. That you have a guy with Santana that can go with him and they stop any kind of big losing streaks. As far as the Mets are concerned, though, I think that they have to address at some point what they're going to do with the catching situation. Is a, a Santos totally, as you will look at David Ross who's coming in the game for Atlanta, and Kyle Cobb is going to be the pitcher. Is, is totally Santos the way you want to go with a platoon? Uh, is David Murphy your first baseman? And is Angel Pagan your left fielder? Those are the question marks, I think, that um, uh, there are the hard answers. Carlos Beltran takes a strike. Yeah, I think there's a there's a, an overall too to this team. You know, for all the talk about injuries, there's been something of a I'm not even sure how to put it. As Beltran hits it out to right center field, over in the gap goes the cloud to call one away. Kind of a, a, a fundamental cloud over this team. That's a good way to put it. I, I think that, and, I, and Jerry's addressed this, that there has to be a way to get this team a little bit better focused on the bases in particular um, to get the most out of the talent that they have on this team because there's a lot of talent here. Well, there's, yeah, there's two ways to, to uh, combat that. Is that now, you know, we're talking about players that no one wants to do anything fundamentally wrong. So let's just use that. But they do. How do you com combat that? There's only two ways to do it. One, you have a guy on the bench, whether it's an assistant coach or a player, mostly a player is better, who, uh, who will put a finger in your chest and say, hey, come on, let's wake up. This is, uh, we're better than this. Murphy retired for the first time today on a line drive to LaRoche. And then secondly, is uh, Jerry can do, do it by the use of the line of card. And that's uh, the biggest uh, way to wake up a player is that if he does not do what he's supposed to do, he's not in the lineup for a couple days. And you sit on that bench and you think about it and you go, boy, I wonder if I'm ever going to get in that lineup again. Those are the, uh, I'm never going to make that mistake again. Those are the kind of things that you can do. Also from a you know, developing your talent from the minor leagues, having the quality coaching down there to teach the fundies of the game. Frank Hoare is 0 for 2, and he fouls it away. I mean, I think also there's been such an emphasis, an overemphasis on production in this game. Um, numbers numbers yeah putting up numbers and numbers are great you don't win without numbers but as I said before you can you can enhance what you've got if you play the game the right way and that's the difference between winning and losing off well I think it was telling that uh, one of the themes of uh, Jerry spring training that did not come to pass because of the loss of the core players from court grounds out was that they needed more team offense not numbers for individuals but team offense let's go one two three against kawakami in the sixth 11 to three brave
There's a place for that. Mets Block V presented by Verizon. It's featured on SNY.TV, don't you know? Your online home of all things New York sports. Here's your app like trivia question. What pitcher has the most career wins without ever winning 20 games in a season? Well, didn't Don Sutton for a long time not yeah. win 20? No, he he did, finally did. Did it once. Did it right. once. And Mussina did it last year. Changes in the outfield for the Mets. Corey Sullivan will play left field. Angel Pagan moves from left field to center field. And Jeremy Reed comes on to play right. And Sullivan will bat fourth. And Ken Takahashi is going to take the mound after the scoreless inning by Bobby Parnell. It's been scored upon in his 14 of his last 17 outings. And we've told you this before, but the third player in the post-World War II era to make his big league debut at age 40 or older was Satchel Page and Olivo. Diomedes Olivo. Garrett Anderson delivered a two-run homer in the first inning tonight. One for three. Takahashi, the fifth med pitcher of the night. Pat Mish went the first inning and a third, a lot, eight runs and seven hits. Lance Broadway, an inning and two thirds, three runs, three hits. But Toby Stoner, two hitless innings, and Bobby Parnell, one hitless inning. It'll be Anderson, then Adam LaRoche, and Matt Diaz. Frankie Rodriguez working on his dance moves. <laughs> Frankie earned the one out save yesterday. A closer's best friend. It's the first one he's had for the Mets this year, isn't it? making his first appearance in five days strikes out the first man to face him and now Adam LaRoche who's over two in a walk LaRoche sat out yesterday because of a stiff back missed the game with the Phillies Braves are just happy to come to a place where it's not raining yeah they have an hour and 51 minute rain delay in the middle of that game against the Philadelphia Phillies so that's three times in the last, what, six days yeah. that they've had two-hour rain delays? Of course, they have the two against the Mets. They're in the National League wild card standings. The Rockies are off tonight. They're playing the Padres tomorrow. The Giants are in action tonight. They'll be playing at Arizona with Barry Zito pitching. The Marlins are off. They play the Phillies tomorrow. Strike three call. So all the worst down looking at the changeup. Back to back strikeouts for Takahashi. And left handers who had hit Takahashi very hard early in his Mets debut. Now, not so much because of that improvement of that curveball slider. So now Matt Diaz bats with two out and nobody on. There's a score in Chicago where the Twins are up 2 0 in the fourth behind Nick Blackburn. Down to third where Tatis handles it. A one, two, three inning for Takahashi. Seventh inning stretch time at City Field. Braves up 11 to three.
the lights are all on in the city. Uh -huh. Rather nice. Beautiful evening in New York. The last day of summer. The last throws of your summertime of excitement. The autumnal equinox arrives shortly after 5 o'clock tomorrow. Boy, it wasn't much of a summer, was it? Nothing but rain and cool weather. Reed Gorecki, the Long Islander, comes in to play left field. And as Josh Tolley leads off for the Mets in the bottom of the seventh. Well, you know, the thing about summer is it will be back next year. Hopefully. Tolley's 0 for 2, grounded out twice, drove in a run, and he lines one to left. Gorecki playing shallow is there to grab it. Well, they've got the book on Tolley, yeah. and they play him very shallow to the opposite field, and that served the Braves well. One away. And here's Wilson Valdez, who has been up twice and struck out both times. Game two of this series tomorrow night, Nelson Figueroa against Jair Jurgens. One of the best young pitchers in the game. Ronnie, do you have all the games, Ronnie? Yes, I do. You don't have a day off, day off the rest I, of the way? I do. Uh, Friday night when you come back here against the Astros, I have off. You do? Yes. So you will miss Dave Clark's New York managerial debut. Yeah, no problem with that. No problem missing that. <laughs> Watch what you say. Dave was a gold glove boxer as a kid. Oh, okay. I'll be nice. I'll be nice. <laughs> one and one to Valdez. Let's check in with Kevin. Yeah, Kevin? guys, the Wilson Valdez bats here. You, we've seen him play a pretty nice field, and I was talking to him today about, uh, you know, when did he start playing shortstop? Has that been as always his, his first position, his love, so to speak? And the story is kind of funny. He said, you know, in the Dominican Republic, he and his friends would always be out as young, young kids just throwing the rock around, even if they could throw it off the wall, whatever. And the first time they were allowed to get on and play on a field, he said it was like the gates opened and everybody just kind of ran. And he said, I ran, um, just kind of kept going, and I stopped. And I turned around, and I asked my friends, where should I go? And my one friend said, right there. And right there happened to be shortstop. So I played on the field at short that day as he goes down looking there for strike three. I played on the field shortstop that day, and it just kind of stuck. And that was my position since I was a little kid. So uh, that's how he started. And it's interesting, even now, as he tries to stay in the major leagues and stay in the eyes of, of scouts and everyone else, he, he says he plays winter ball every year, and he tries to play a new position to get better at other positions. But clearly, shortstop, he's, he's very, very good with the glove there. Guys? He is certainly impressed. He is a pure shortstop. Yeah. Two out and nobody on now. Anderson Hernandez, who tripled and scored in the fifth inning. Came on as a pinch hitter in the third and stayed in. Both teams doing a lot of clearing of their benches in a lopsided game. Braves led 4 0 after one, 8 to 1 after two, and 11 to 1 after three. Tonight after the postgame show, it's 30 minutes of what matters the most to you. The latest news on all things New York sports on Geico Sports Night tonight after the postgame and at 1 a.m. right here on SNY. <laughs> Grounded to the right side for Prado. And he throws out Hernandez. Six up and six down for Kawakami. Seven of the books now at City Field. Braves leading big.
Superfly trivia question. We asked which pitcher has the most wins without winning 20 in a year. Ah, El Presidente. Yep. He had a perfect game, but no 20 win season. I sat there and watched the tea, uh, that perfect game. Great pitcher, El Presidente. Great curveball. By the way, one of the great radio calls of all time, the last out, Dave Van Horn, who was yep. doing games at the time for the Expos. El Presidente, El Perfecto. Oh, very nice. One of the best of all time. David Ross hitting ninth in the order up for the first time. Seven home runs in just 123 at bats this year. He's got some pop. He's got some pop, that's for sure. Can we form our Cincinnati Red Leg? What was the year they called them the Red Legs? Was well, they were originally the Red Legs back in 1869. Right. Didn't they bring that back one year? I forget. It doesn't matter. It might have when they uh, tried to introduce that Ted Klazuski uniform, right? With yeah, the, the vest. vest. I always liked the red legs. Chris Kozuski had to have the sleeves cut off because his arms were so yeah. big. Yeah, the guns. By the way, speaking of Dennis Martinez, Keith, you hit 300 against him. No, no, if I did, I hit one home run off him. He threw me a hanging changeup. That's what it says here. He Nine was, for 30 with a home run. Let me tell you something. I don't know how I did that. He was a difficult mark. Talk about a guy who had a lot of pitches. Yes, he had a great curveball. And he was used to um, throw a sidearm with the curveball and the fastball. One thing about Dennis Martinez, I'll never forget, he had a mean streak in him. So he'd be pitching a game and he'd be rolling along with a shutout after seven innings. And with two outs, he would drill somebody. I mean, just out of nowhere. And I'm talking about pinpoint control all game long. And then came out of nowhere and people were, what was that for? And he had a good memory of things that had happened in games before. And he did not let you get away with it. Man responsible for bringing Dennis Martinez to the major leagues. That's Frank Cashin. That's right. Who found him in Nicaragua. There hadn't been any players from Nicaragua before, except David Green. In from right field comes Jeremy Reed to catch the fly ball by Ross for the first down. One out and nobody else checking with Jonas Schwartz. He's standing by with a New York State Smokers quit line game break. Important, important, also important. Tim Wakefield pitching for the Red Sox tonight. If he's healthy, that yeah. gives them a whole different dimension. Well, he's healthy. Uh, Dice K has come back and has thrown much better. They're starting to get that rotation back where they want it because Lester and Beckett are a given. Nate McLeod, two for four tonight. By the way, just to one other note on that trivia answer with Dennis Martinez. There are three other pitchers who have won at least 200 games without ever winning 20. One of whom pitched for the Mets briefly. And some will say ineffectively, certainly his last pitch was rather ineffective. Oh, it was against this Bravo team too, wasn't it in the playoffs? Yes, that would be Kenny Rogers. <laughs> the other two pitchers who won 200 without winning 20. Milt Pappas Ooh. and Jerry Royce. Mm. Milt Pappas, the famous trade Frank Cashin made for Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson for Milt Pappas. Milt Pappas had won 20 games, was a very good pitcher. And he head up for Big Frank and enabled Frank to be the only player to win the MVP in both leagues. Won the Triple Crown his first season in Baltimore and the World Series. Worst moniker ever put on a player. We think he's an old third. Well, the payback is, uh, you know what? <laughs> Who was that? Was that Bob Housen who called him an old third? Does he go that far back? In Cincinnati. And Jerry Royce, he was, I loved watching Jerry Royce pitch. Jerry Royce was an inter kick. interesting uh, pitcher. He was one of the few that could literally pitch with a fastball all game long because he used to cut and sink at the same time. When he was first up, I think some of the Pirates yeah. he just had a slow curveball and he developed a slider. He's a funny story. He came up with the Cardinals. And the story on him, why they traded him, was that Jerry married into, was very intelligent and bright and quirky. Great to talk to. My a good friend of mine. Um, he married a very, his wife is very wealthy. 
and he would take her on the road all the time, wanted her on the road when the day you weren't supposed to yeah. bring your wives on the road. That's right. And then Jerry wanted to sweep. <laughs> Cloth hits it hard and short hop by Murphy. Do or die play for Murph. He does. Two out. And you know, you just back in those days, you just didn't do those things. He was a relatively young player, yeah. and so they got mad at him and traded him. Cardinals traded within two years. Steve Carlton, Jerry Royce, and Mike Torres. Wow. How about that? Wow. A lot of pitching. Kelly Johnson batting for Martin Prado. Johnson's been playing very little lately at the beginning of the year as the starting second baseman. It was not Bob Housen, it was Bill DeWitt. He was the Reds GM who called Frank Robinson an old 30. Now, if you think of a nickname for DeWitt when you think of uh, that trade, <laughs> Whitless. Well, what hurt Frank Robinson's career was the sliding in second base in that double play. Yeah. Got hit in the, right between the eyes and knocked him out, and he never was the same again. When did that happen? Uh, I forget, but he got hit on a, a, a double play and a throw. As a red? As a uh, Oriole. Oriole. And it, all the, his, it was, uh, had developed his vertigo. He had he? vertigo, yeah. and he never was the same after that. Still had some pretty good years. Yes, but he was still in his prime. He had good years. Went to but Cleveland where he was player manager. How about that day? Cle you know, opening day in Cleveland, player manager. He puts himself in the lineup and he hits a home run in his first at bat. It's magical. 3 1 to Johnson, and he foul steps to 3 and 2. What happened to Kelly Johnson? Rough year. Hitting just 220. Wonder what his future is going to be with the Braves or elsewhere. Ball four. You know the Braves the last few years have had kind of a history of second baseman going south on yeah. first Marcus Giles, and then uh, then Johnson. Well, Johnson had had some good years. He had some big hits too, and it was he and Langerhans that really came up that were fighting for left field. But they moved Kelly Johnson in. Glenn Hubbard, who's the first base coach for the Braves, worked very hard with Kelly to get him comfortable at second base, but really struggled this season, not only defensively, but offensively also. Oh, I loved about Kelly Johnson was that he hit left handers well. well Tom Glavin special. Remember he had a couple of lead off home right. runs against Glavin? Chipper Jones with four RBIs tonight, including a three run homer back in the second that broke this game open and knocked Pat Mish out of the box. Brian Stokes, the sixth Met pitcher of the night. Braves have, had, have not had a hit since the third inning. Martin Prado's two run double with two out in the third was their last hit. They didn't need no, any more hits. No matter. <laughs> Big night for the Braves as they try and keep their dim playoff hopes alive. A win tonight, and they would be five games behind Colorado. The Rockies idle tonight. And Chipper hits one right back to Stokes. And that'll do it for the Braves in the top of the eighth. A walk in one left. Middle of the eighth, 11 3 Atlanta.
Derek Lee with four RBIs. They lead the Brewers. Jason Bay's three-run homer. Tim Wakefield on the mound. And the Red Sox are in charge in Kansas City. That game's in the fourth inning. And the Twins lead the White Sox 2-0 in the fifth behind Nick Blackburn as they look to cut Detroit's lead back to two and a half games in the AL Central. Boy, Jason Bay sure found a home in Boston. Huh? It's called Salary Drive, Keith. 36 home runs, and he's a free agent at the end of the year. Certainly a guy the Mets will be thinking about. Of course, at one time, Jason Bay was in the Mets organization. The Mets are one of three organizations that let Jason Bay go before he settled with the Pirates. He had uh, big shoes to fill in Boston, did he not? Manny? Yep. I know Manny had worn out his welcome, but still, to come in, yeah, there's a lot of pressure. And you've got Manny Ramirez out there, and you're taking his spot. I mean, that's like when Ray Knight took Pete Rose's spot. In Cincinnati. You know, I will say, though, for the people I know in the Boston organization and the people around that team, that not only did he replace them physically with his play, but even uh, more importantly, uh, brought a professionalism and, and quiet uh, confidence yep. to that position that just simmered down and quieted all the noise. Didn't fill up the headlines the same way Manny did, but he certainly was able to replace him in the lineup in the box score. Pagan is 0 for 3 tonight. But he snuck an RBI in and back in the fifth. He drove in the third run for the Mets. And he lifts this one to shallow left. Reed Garecki. Oh, it's it away, one away. Well, here's a Mercedes Benz attention assist of the game. David Wright with a slow grounder and Martin Prado with a pretty play again. It certainly was. Much like the play that Luis Castillo made earlier. To his left. Seven up and seven down for Kenshin Kawakami. Now Fernando Tatis bats for the second time and takes a rip. Tatis pinch in the fifth inning, state of the game at third base to give David Wright the rest of the night off. Luis, uh, excuse me, Fernando's got that average up to 270. That's a big climb for him. It was interesting that first swing, of course, was a huge swing, looking like he's going for the downs. Only Fernando would know that. How many times do you think in your career you tried to hit a home run? A handful? Well, not a handful. Not too many, Ronnie. When I was red hot, I got a ball up. Hanging. Yeah. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Bud Light, by Honda, and by City. City never sleeps. Well, that's camera number two right there. That's Al's camera. He's not even holding it. Do you know the numbers of any other cameras? Al has no, he's doing with no hands. Look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Corey Sullivan up for the first time. Where he's been strolling at the plate lately. And he takes a strike. <sighs> and the curveball from Kawakami 0 and 2. I've been told that that was not Al's camera, it was camera 15. How many cameras do we have? It's too much for Bill. <laughs> <laughs> One and two now to Sullivan. Gary, you remember that commercial that MSG did with, with Bill Webb in the truck? That that great ad around five years ago, wasn't it? And no, I had a, it was be, a camera behind Bill in the truck. And Bill doing like around 20 seconds with all the cameras. So he, you were there. You, it was a great commercial. I didn't see it. I was, I was, uh, was my favorite commercial. I was busy on the radio. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about cameras. <laughs> Three and two That's now. Right. All, all we had were, were microphones. That was, was a fascinating look at what a director does in the middle of an inning. Was it a little bit like Monday Night Football where they have, you know, where you have the director, you know, saying to the different cameras? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Did it show what Bill really does, or it was, you know, a, a cleaned up version? Well, let's just say it didn't show, it didn't show what he does between innings. <laughs> Three 
22 from Kawakami. And fouled again. Now Bill tells me that he can do games in the mirror. I believe it. I bet you can do them with one hand tied behind his back. It was fat. You had a great time in that truck, didn't you? That was did. an experience for time. you. Had a great time. Watching it, Bill direct is like watching you broadcast. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, the, the ability to multitask. Oh, okay. Rip toward right center field by Sullivan. He's got himself a base hit, snapping out of a long over. And Corey slides in safely with a two base hit. Well, nice hustle out, out of the box by Corey here. Gets a high fastball. And hustling all the way. You don't want to get thrown out here. You're down so many runs. But that's just good aggressive base running. Had it easy. So the Mets have a two out base runner. And now Jeremy Reed up for the first time. Took over in right field in the seventh inning. And takes the strike. That's now with seven hits in the game. Four of the seven have been for extra bases. Reed hitting a 252. Homer descends, gets up in the men's bullpen. He's been pitching every day. One down the line foul. Everybody's got to lead the league in something. Jeremy Reed leads the league in games played as a defensive substitute. This is his 41st game this year that he's come in as a defensive replacement. Strike three call. Reed down looking. Second strikeout for Kawakami. He threw his three scoreless innings. Braves up 11 to 3. Take the turn at bat against Brian Stokes. Now, Akami's worked three scoreless innings in relief, and if he completes the bottom of the ninth, he will qualify for a save. Pitch three or more innings and finish the game, regardless of the score, you can get a save. Stokes worked a hitless eighth. There was a game involving Texas and Baltimore a couple of years ago where 
Pitcher got a save in a 30 to 3 game. Kalakami retired for the first so down. Was that Texas Baltimore? Yeah. Shouldn't be a save. First game of a doubleheader. <laughs> oh, Good Lord. Well, there's a lot of things about the save rule that probably shouldn't be. And, but I'm just saying 11 to 3 is not quite as no, no. egregious as 30 to 3. Well, it's, you know, it's a shame, and, and uh, you know, probably baseball purists won't like this, but, you know, it's September, so. We have so many more pitchers in the bullpen. If this were a game maybe in mid-May or June, you might see an everyday player going out there to throw an inning. I always like that, by the way. Well, you know, the Mets never had a player, a position player, go to the mound for their first 29 seasons. 1992 was the first time that a Met position player, I guess the first 30 seasons, 92 was the 31st year. The first Met position player ever to go to the mound was Bill Pakoda. In a game in Pittsburgh in 1992. How do you, how do you fare? Do you remember? Don't. Okay. Were you, gone? The, were you gone, Ronnie? I was gone. Yeah. The best Met position player ever to go to the mound was Desi Relaford. He pitched a one-two-three inning through a gas. Wow. Yes. I saw that game. The worst was Derek Bell. <laughs> Bell was throwing about 65 miles an hour, or what we thought. Uh, this was in San Diego. What we thought were knuckleballs, but. They, they weren't. They weren't. <laughs> and I'm sure he was one of those guys that always bragged about what a great pitcher he had been in the day. <laughs> Out to center field where Pagan is patrolling. And Escobar retired for the second out. Well, tomorrow night the Mets will try and get even in this series. Nelson Figueroa against Jair Jurgen. 6.30 the coverage tomorrow night right here on SNY for the Mets and Braves. Now Reed Gorecki will bat for the first time. Reed, who was born in Queens, went to high school at Kellenberg Memorial in Uniondale. He takes a cut, nothing in one. Gorecki looking for his first big league home run and would like nothing more than to hit it here <laughs> in his hometown. Slider from Stokes missing two and one. Gorecki went on from Kellenberg to University of Delaware. He is a blue hen. <laughs> they still running the double wing at, uh, at Delaware. When I was in high school, we ran the Delaware wing T. Tubby Raymond, right? What a great offense that was. Do you know uh, Tubby Raymond was the yeah. coach of Delaware for years? You know who his son is, right? I do know. Dave Raymond, the original That's right. Philly fanatic. That's right. The son of the Delaware football coach, Tubby Raymond. Really? Yep. Learn something new every day. 2 2 to Gorecki. Foul the back. You've learned a lot tonight. Beer and pretzels in North Dakota. Yep. Swing and a miss. And Gorecki down. First strikeout for Stokes to the bottom of the ninth, 11 to 3.
New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by IOTV. Get the best in HD free with IOTV. By Geico. By Lexus. And by Corona. Enjoy responsibly. Last of the night, Daniel Murphy leads off against Kenshi and Kawakami. Oh, my, that's a first. In a lopsided game, why not bring your netting? Seems like it'd be something back in 1905. Knit or... one, pearl two. What's three? I don't know. <laughs> I've gotten that far. <laughs> She did those two socks together? Oh, no. Mittens, maybe. No? Socks, I guess. But two at a time? Murphy tonight with a double and a home run. That's four extra base hits in the last two games for Murph. His 11th home run gives him the club lead. Three and one from Kawakami. It's catching. Wow. Are you kidding? Knitting fever. Catch it. Quilting beat. Wow. Three and two to Murphy. Nick Evans on deck to pinch hit. And then Josh Tolley here in the last of the night. I was going to say, the, the game's been going on so long. Decided early, they've already been, had time to make a couple caps. Met fans. You know, it was the first day of summer. The last day of, the sum, of summer when the game began. Now it's <laughs> That's win, right. we, winter. We skipped right over fall. <laughs> well, it's like girls' night out. Oh, man. They're all watching the kids. Outstanding. Nice that they were matching caps. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and more knitting. Let's see. Who knew that this many people knitted at the uh, game? I, well, they, I mean, maybe this is their night. They have their own knitting club. I don't know. That looked like three different groups that yeah. we've shown so far. Very impressive. Is there any crocheting going on? You think our cameras could find that? Macrame. They just got they just got the phone call that they're on TV. There are no secrets anymore. Escobar on the back end didn't have to do that. What else? There are your probable pitchers for tomorrow's game. Nelson Figueroa goes for the Mets and Jair Jurgens, who pitched a fine game against the Mets in Atlanta, will face them again tomorrow. 6.30 the coverage on SNY. Now Nick Evans to pitch it. By the way, you were asking about Bill Pakoda and that first ever game pitched by a Mets position player. Yes. One inning. One run on a home run by Andy Van Slyke. Oh. Final score, Pirates 19, Mets 2. Andy's one of those to take advantage. <laughs> well, I remember um, <laughs> Matt Franco pitched a game at Shea Stadium that was 16 nothing. I think he gave up a home run to Andrew Jones. I had a home run off, three run home run off of uh, Tommy Hutton. Uh, the that right? In St. Louis, when he's with the Phillies. He came in in a blowout. Tried to throw me a little hook and uh, I told the catcher, relax, I got this one. <laughs> See, if he, had done it as a, if he had done it as a Met, I would say it was retribution for the way Hud used to hit Seaver, but that ruined the whole story. Strike three call, so Evans is down looking and the Mets are down to their final out of the night. So Kawakami with a chance for a save. Right after the game, join Jonas Schwartz and Bobby Ojeda for all of tonight's highlights, exclusive interviews, Jerry's post-game reactions, Lincoln Mercury post-game live right after tonight's game. Now after all 162 Mets games, right here on SNY. Good catch, Gary. 
Josh Tolley, the final hope for New York. And he drives one to center field, chasing McClough a long way back. And McClough runs it down, and the ball game is over. Nicely done by McClough. Kawakami with a four-inning save. The Braves with 11 runs in the first three innings, hit three home runs off Pat Mish, and blow the Mets out early tonight, 11-3. Well, the Braves scored 11 runs in the first three.